changing factors in terms of external environmental factors. So um, perhaps some of you may not know, a lot of the digital tech and software that are being used with Amazon are actually created internally. Just because they understand that data is king, they refuse to actually provide or give any opportunity to outsiders or outside companies to gain their data, right? So moving, moving towards digital talents. Now, how do we define digital talents? Obviously, with all these changes and all these examples that I've provided earlier on, um, the need for digital talent is crucial. And here, among all the students that are here, you know, all of you are digital talents, in fact. And also, let's not forget um, all the researchers and all the people that are listening, the academics that are listening in, you as well have digital talents. So digital talents include skills and competencies in digital for aspect of marketing. We are looking at key technical skills, being able to understand what are SEOs, SEMs, being able to do data analytics, um, being able to do content creation. So I would say that to close the gap between the skills and competencies required, between the academics, the researchers, and also the students, is that you need to get your hands dirty. So I remember when I was asked to teach a very new module, which is not so new now, it's called Social Media Analytics and Web Analytics in Malaysia. Um, I cannot teach it from any textbook because it's got a lot of information provided. And I refuse to take information only from the internet because I know that students can also refer to the internet. So the only way for me to be able to be very authentic and teach them the things that, you know, I would experience myself is if I got my hands dirty. I, so I created a lot of different accounts. I created a blog. I created my TikTok account. I make sure I know how to read those analytics. To those examples from my own personal experience, I share them in the class. So I feel that to close the gap, these are essentials, technical skills. Non-technical competencies such as communication skills, being adaptive, being able to negotiate, all these things, but all balance it because sometimes you may need to communicate ideas with non-tech people, right? So uh, if let's say we are looking at importance of digital talents in marketing, then definitely digital talents are the one to drive innovation. They are the ones to come up with creative ideas. So it's really crucial for us to actually leverage on digital talents. And how are we as higher education providing this platform for developing digital talents? Obviously, we play a huge role here um, it, and it cannot work on one. One thing I've noticed is that really good. I feel that um, Institute Pelita Indonesia I can see that the institution is very vibrant. The students are multi-talented from the video earlier on. And uh, there's a lot of effort being put in place, which is great by the academics and the researchers to actually engage students in this activity. And I think even for today's conference, students are involved. So you are already moving towards the right path. I feel that you know this slide is really insignificant, yeah? So what we are doing over here, I can perhaps share some examples of how um, Nottingham Trent University is actually doing in terms of developing digital talents in marketing. So firstly, in terms of curriculum integration and co-creation. So we believe students have a voice in our, in our curriculum. So some um, academics might find that this is really, really new. It's a bit scary and challenging. But we believe that updating curriculum is very important, especially for modules like marketing that are constantly changing. So we offer at NTU a co-creation fund for students and academics to come together and develop modules collaboratively. So students can give their ideas how they want to learn. So they can give topics, um, they can suggest even assessment for the module, all right? And secondly, we also have partnerships and um, knowledge sharing programs. So we collaborate a lot with um, industry and businesses to provide simulations and real world marketing issues for our students. 
So our students would play the role of marketing consultants acting as marketing agency. So they would spend like half their time only in uni and the other half working very closely with clients. And we also look at how we can help students to do continuous upskilling. And we are not saying students only, but sometimes faculty members also need to upskill um, and also co do continuous learning and training. So we provide students with a lot of different access to platforms like LinkedIn Learning, and they are required to actually complete 60 hours of CPD, which is continuous um, professional development learning before they graduate. So it's 20 hours per year that they need to complete. So they can take part in workshops, they can take part in online learning, conferences such as this to earn these 60 hours. So I'm sure that um, many institutions are also actually doing equal things, you know, trying to boost up our graduates and also employability of our digital talents. So essentially, there's a lot that can be done, definitely, and I'm very open to sharing. So I just want to share a bit more as well in terms of um, my own examples where I'm currently working on some of the projects. So the first project is actually on co-designing a gamified experience for tourists. So if you read up on some of my profile and just as what is explained, you realize that I'm very much into tourism marketing and sustainable tourism. So we are trying to create this app, which is from sepo.io, and it is able to provide sort of like a gamification. So you can include some quizzes, you can include some information about different locations and destinations. So what we do is students would go out and they would play this game on their own with the app, right? So we are trying to develop this. We have used this as a pilot for our um, induction week with the new students, so they enjoyed that. And I want to roll this out for my international tourism module. So I'm also including some of the aspects and opinion from the students in the, um, in the class so that they can tell me what are the places that they want to go to, All right? So this is one of the um, projects that I'm currently working on. And my second project related to digital marketing is actually on sustainable tourism. Um, if you can look at the three pictures, can you tell the differences, which is actually influencer generated, which is user generated, and which is AI generated? All right, there are three there. Influencer generated, user generated, and AI generated. Now looking at these pictures, um, part of my project is actually this user, the people that are, the people that are traveling or intending to travel. Are they able to differentiate between these three um, images in front of them? And how does that actually influence them or encourage them to visit those places? Among all the three pictures, which one you are most likely to visit? The first one looks somewhat like an Amazon jungle, probably an island somewhere. And the third one is actually in the, right? So just to give hints, the third one is actually my own picture taken when I visited Lake Toba. So that is definitely user generated. Okay. So um, I'm working with collaborators from Malaysia, from Portugal, and also from UK to look into this project. Um, the idea is we want courage to be responsible in their decision making. And I have another uh, project that I'm currently also involved in, which is creating a 60 credit hour marketing agency module. Because we see that a lot of times, a lot of feedback that we get from graduates, um, fresh graduates are that they come back and tell us that we feel that we don't have enough skills and experience to work. And we feel that there's too much changes in the industry in marketing, especially that uh, we are not ready for it. And we feel that we don't have enough opportunity to build up these skills while we are in university itself. We are too busy studying, we are too busy playing, we are too busy with assignments. Okay, so we decided to create this 60 credit marketing agency module where we mirror real world challenges. So students can pass this module by working on consultancy projects with clients. Um, at the end of it, we are not just assessing them based on the outputs, based on the recommendations on that consultancy project, but we are also uh, assessing them based on their portfolio. So how did they develop themselves? 
what kind of skills and competencies that they have managed to gain throughout that consultancy project. Um, so we are looking more at the process. So we are not telling them where to look for the resources, but rather we are, we are giving them the freedom to actually um, express themselves, to actually learn. And also we are just making sure that whatever skills that they pick up, they are aligned with professional bodies, such as the Chartered Institute of Marketing. And the last project that I'm actually involved in, in terms of research, is actually looking at AI adoption among business educators in emerging economies. Because I realize that even though it's important to look at students' perspective, um, I feel that a lot of educators are actually also struggling um, to deal with AI. It's as though we know what is AI, but we're not very sure of what it is and where it is going. So there's a lot of uncertainty, there's a lot of ethical issues, there's a lot of well-being related issues as well. So on the basis of this, we actually want to find out. Um, we have rolled out the pilot study for this, we have collected the first stage of data. So we are going into the quantitative um, study at the time being. In this study, we are including Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam and Thailand. So I'm sharing all these projects just to show you that um, even as academics, we constantly have to do continuous work in terms of our areas to understand so that we can actually share this knowledge with our students as well. So they will know that we are also being very relevant in the market. But with all that being said, um, you know, developing digital talent and being involved in all these projects related to digital uh, marketing has its own challenges and opportunities. So these are foreseeable challenges and opportunities that you know I don't have questions on, but if you do, um, please feel free to share as well. Um, first of all, of course, the main challenge is sustainability and ethics. There are rising consumer awareness, especially on privacy issues, on regulations that we need to follow, especially in UK, they are very strict on GDPR, which is the Privacy and also the Data Protection Act. And navigating ethical dilemmas can be very, very challenging for some of the people um, in marketing. Perhaps they feel that using customer data is not very ethical, but it's a requirement to personalize services. So students these days need to be equipped with both the knowledge in terms of the law, the legal aspects of things, but also having that ethical stand in them, having that moral strength um, to make the right decisions. In, in, in business. So this can be, I feel, inculcated in the classrooms itself in terms of how we actually um, enhance this knowledge about being ethical to the students to tell them what is right, what is wrong, and then allow them the uh, room to make certain errors, but learn from those errors. So we cannot stop students from using AI tools. Um, what I found out from the previous study, the pilot study that I did was that in some countries, in some institutions, uh, AI tools such as ChatGPT is completely banned. It's like a sacred word that nobody talks about. Okay, But in over here in UK, we have come to embrace that we cannot stop AI. We cannot stop using from, we cannot stop students from using ChatGPT. It's just a way of how we can teach them to use it better to use it to their advantage, to leverage on it and enable them to see the weaknesses in those AI tools and how they as, they as human beings can come in to actually supplement AI tools, right? So uh, we also try to uh, you know, tell them what are some of the challenges and opportunities in terms of being very data-driven. Of course, a lot of data is also not good because it can be very overwhelming for some people, for some companies. And how do they use these machine learning algorithms to make decisions, to personalize marketing strategies? Um, this, is, this is the other thing about talent acquisition. Um, are you getting sufficient talent? Are we actually sending out uh, graduates that are having enough skills to deal with this big data to enable companies to be data-driven? So nowadays, data scientists and big data experts are actually highly sorted after. They're highly paid professionals. So the question is, how can our students actually differentiate themselves 
um, through these unique skills and experiences, are they actually equipped? Have, this, have they the skill sets to meet those career opportunities and to grab on those um, career offerings that are provided? So in terms of that, you know, that leaves me with the last question, which is preparing the future of marketing. Um, embracing this digital technology is actually very important because it helps to foster a lot of innovation that is happening. And it helps us to actually uh, make sure that, you know, we are always on top in the business. However, the question is, you know, are we preparing our students enough to actually develop themselves? So that is, that is really what I'm leaving all of you with, you know, questions. So I'm really sorry, I'm not a, a provider of answers to many of these questions, but I feel that um, perhaps, you know, maybe I'm open to a lot of the sharing if anybody has any answers to share to this later on, all right? So I think that's all from me. And thank you very much for listening, for paying attention. Um, I know some of you are actually being here because you have to be here. Uh, so thank you for being here. And that's my LinkedIn. I hope the QR works. So you can scan it and then we can keep in touch um, on any projects that you're interested in or, you know, those projects that I have explained earlier on. And back to you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. City. That's wonderful. That's wonderful <laughs> yes, it's very insightful. Said. Okay, um, so let us conclude some of the um, presentation. So Dr. Siti actually shows how marketing keeps changing from time to time. Yes, yes Mr. Agus. And it's overall due to the technology innovation. Actually. Technology and innovation. This is definitely one of the things that is important for mm -hmm. most of us to actually take note of, especially the higher education. Yes, and also uh, we can see some of the companies that she mentioned, like Kodak, Nokia. Yes. Yes, they these big names. Yes, these big names. They refuse to upgrade their technologies, and also maybe being in the comfort zone, not innovate enough, so um, the competitors can outpace them. And also, Dr. City mentioned about um, the use of AI in supporting marketing. Yeah. And also, um, how we prepare our students as the higher educations to develop their digital talent in marketing. Yeah, this is important mm -hmm. because um, as it continues to change, the landscape, the, the business landscape continues to change, there will always be this kind of development that the students will always need to know. Mm -hmm, yeah. So that they, they do need to actually keep up with this. Yes, agree. <laughs> so important there. And... Uh, of course, uh, Dr. City also mentioned about the uh, some of the key trends uh, that is uh, important in you know, marketing nowadays is that one of them is actually an immersive experience. Technology, and we have even heard of like using the VR mm -hmm. or the virtual reality and even the mixed reality to, uh, in this case, uh, Dr. City also used that to promote tourism. And uh, this is an uh, interesting uh, development. Yes, that's yeah. actually interesting. Yeah, and in Indonesia, I think uh, it's, it's also it's so good to have that because there are lots of tourism areas mm -hmm. in Indonesia. Yes. And uh, using data to enhance customer experiences. And Dr. City actually mentioned about Amazon. Mm -hmm. I remember last time buying from Amazon and they always mention at the bottom there, hey, um, bought, uh, frequently bought together, right? Mm -hmm. Frequently bought together with uh, this item is uh, this item. So it actually makes it very interesting for the customer to actually buy more from, from, from the company itself. And uh, of course, uh, she did mention about uh, some of the, uh, uh, gener the, the, the AI, AI generated content as well as a user generated content. And this is a very interesting thing uh, when it comes to sustainability and ethics and how in how we actually use this, this uh, uh, AI in order to actually enhance our learning. And uh, that's that's why that is important, as uh, she mentioned, that it's important to that the students also know about the law as well as the ethics, more ethics. Yes, in, that is very important. That. Yeah, I think, yeah, that's that's a very insightful uh presentations uh, by Dr. City and I think we is uh we would like to thank Dr. City for 
uh, um, the great presentations. And I think we will uh, please uh, wait for, for a short while, uh, Dr. Siti, for the Q&A session later. Yes, we will commence the Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Yeah. So if you don't mind, we continue. We move to the second speaker. All right, so our second speaker joined University Selangor or UNICEL in March 2022 as a professor in information system and management at the Faculty of Business and Accountancy. She previously was working at the Faculty of Business and Accountancy, University of Malaya since 1996. And her primary research activities are in the area of information systems adaption behavior um, by private organizations, public sectors, SMEs, and individual users. She actively participated in research projects funded by UNICEL and University Malaya. Um, she has actively researched, presented, and published in the area of information system disciplines, particularly in adoption and utilization behavior of information systems and the effect of innovative information systems adoptions, such as online social media, electronic commerce, and some of the innovative information systems, uh, some of the uh, her works received recognition where she was awarded best paper awards in academic conferences and publications related to management and information systems. Um, she also involved in consultancy projects with private organizations, public sectors, and government agencies. And she was also a member of the Malaysia Qualification Agency and International Association for Development of the Information Society based in Germany. So let us welcome our second speaker, Professor Dr. Noor Ahmad Mohamad Saleh from University Selangor, Malaysia. Hello, Hello, Prof Noor. Very good afternoon to you, Prof Noor. How is everyone in Indonesia? And also, we are doing uh, really good. Nottingham. <laughs> so, <laughs> they all is doing well, right? Okay, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. All right, so uh, it was quite very interesting what Dr. Siti has brought up in terms of the immersive technology and also with regards to AI. And I think it is, is really closely related to the, 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 the speech that I'm going to, to present today, right? Uh, so I can just let me share the thing. Right, can everyone see yes, the- Yes, we can see yes, the slides clearly. Right. Okay, right. so it's just to, uh, you know, like Dr. Siti was uh, suggesting about immersive technology, personalization, hyper-personalization. So, you know, uh, not just in marketing that we need it, but Dr. Siti has proved that, you know, we are moving towards the technology, the digital. And because of that, we need a very skilled uh, digital talent right, to actually uh, run the business and also to effectively use the digital in all aspects of our technology, right? So today, my the things that I'm going to look into is how we can bridge uh, the digital uh, skill, right? Because there seems to be like a, a gap in the digital skill. right? So uh, firstly, I would just like to say I'm very thrilled to be to be here. Thank you to the uh, organizer for actually uh, organize this uh, event. And I think this is a very significant uh, event whereby we are also like, you know, because of the changing of the technology and because of the landscape, the business landscape is also moving towards uh, the industry revolution, the IR 4.0. So we need to be looking into transforming the industry, right? Uh, from finance to healthcare, from uh, retail to manufacturing. And we are now into more of a uh, global uh, competition as well to be, so we need to be competitive advantage, right? So before we can move into all those 
thing is very crucial to explore what are the dynamic digital talent because these are the uh, the the talent that will actually drive the innovation and for organization to actually achieve their business goal you know for them to remain competitive they need to cultivate a skill a workforce that are able to adapt to the new technology and the uh, evolving market. So that's why I choose this uh, topic. And I, you know, the, the the things that I will be looking at is more towards the Malaysian scenario. So the main uh, question that we need to ask, or what is uh, the, the concern uh, of concern is actually, uh, our current workforce skill are keeping pace with the rapid uh, digitalization of the business so if so what are if not what are we what can we do about it so we are looking into you know uh, having the business you know transforming themselves into digital but uh, our current uh, workforce have the skill and they are they able to keep pace with the digitization of the uh, businesses in terms of the digital marketing, business analytics, you know, all businesses are now moving towards digitization, right, and very uh, active as well. So in this session, I will discuss, right, you know, what are the challenges that arise from this uh, skill gap and also some actionable uh, strategies that we can uh, can do to bridge the, uh, this divide. And I will use the uh, Malaysian uh, scenario as an example. So before we uh, move into the... Uh, so before we move on further, so what is the digital skill gap, right? So the digital skill gap is actually uh, the... Uh, what we can say is the mismatch between the skill that the employee currently possess and the skill that is required by the organization in terms of using the digital tools and the technology, right? So the digital gap, actually, before we can talk about digital gap, the, there are two types of skill that a, a digital talent must have. One is the hard skill whereby it is a more of a technical capabilities for example uh, doing the programming data analysis cyber security and cloud computing ai artificial uh, learning uh, artificial intelligence and machine uh, learning with the rise of the uh, digital transformation uh, many uh, across the industry there is a gap that is becoming more problematic Right, so these are the things that we need to look at. And when we talk about the skill, the digital skill, we also need to look into the soft skill in terms of their digital literacy, uh, communication, in terms of their uh, what you call it, problem solving, and how they are able to actually communicate and uh, and also be a problem uh, solver in the organization to assist organization in making the uh, decision. So when we talk about digital skill, it's all about the hard skill together with the soft skill. And the soft skill uh, is also very much, uh, are the one that is much more critical, right? So next, we look into what are the things that are now happening actually in the organization. So according to uh, 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 research, right, uh, by World Economic Forum, 50% of employee with, uh, will need to rescale by 2025 uh, as adoption technology increase. So, and then the uh, McKinsey, McKinsey uh, Global Service says that stated that found that 87% of executive either face skill gap or expected to face uh, them within a few years. So what does this mean? That means there is a uh, shortage of uh, digital talent, right? And nine out of 10 jobs, according to the European uh, Commission, state that, you know, only 42%, right, have lack of basic digital uh, competency. 
if we were to look uh, closely at closer to our home or our region, right? If we move closer to, to our home, the digital skill is not just a global issue. It fell across all over Southeast Asia, right? And many companies in this region are struggling uh, with the demand, right? To rapidly involve in the digital landscape. So these are the things that are uh, happening, right? For example, in uh, the Southeast Asia, 80% 80, 80 of the company in Southeast Asia uh, sees the shortage of digital skills as the barrel for them to transform, right? And uh, when we look at Malaysia, 75% of the company in Malaysia indicate shortage of employee with advanced digital uh, skill, especially uh, in terms of artificial intelligence, which has been highlighted by uh, Dr. Siti in terms of data analytics. And I think in uh, marketing, uh, data analytics is very important, especially to, to know, to get engaged with the customer, to have that attachment with the customer, right? Dr. Siti, right? <laughs> and, right? So those are, are the things, right? So, and Indonesia, also seems to have a digital shortage, right? 93% of the Indonesian uh, firm sees that digital shortage as their barriers to actually go for uh, digital transformation, particularly in the sector of IT, e-commerce, banking, right? So these are some of the uh, survey that has been conducted. So there is a concern on the uh, digital uh, gap. All right. So as we just seen from the statistic in Southeast Asia, the digital gap is a pressing issue. But let us take a moment of understanding why this gap exists. You know, why does it exist in the first place? Right. So what have led to this significant uh, shortage of digital skill across the industry? So if we were to uh, dive deeper into the digital skill, Right, we will see that one of the main uh, contributor of the digital skill gap is because the disparity between what is expected from the organization and what is expected by the talent themselves, by the employee themselves, or by the digital uh, uh, professional themselves. So most of this uh, disparity is actually uh, stem from the misalignment priority in terms of the skill development, career opportunity, culture, and the technology adoption. And this um, uh, misalignment uh, between what the business look for and what digital professional expect from their career is widening the gap, making harder for companies to actually attract, retain, and develop the talent that they need. So, you know, it's, it's not just to say that it is uh, an issue that is happening here in our region, but it's global. Because now we are having this all these uh, new generation that are coming in, right? And this generation have different form of uh, culture. They develop a much more universal culture, that you know is very much uh, different from the uh, older generation, right? So these are the things that we need to look into. This misalignment between what the business are looking for and what uh, professional or talents are expected from this career, you know, we we need to be able to to understand those things. Right? So let us see what is the expectation actually of the. Uh, digital talent, right? So the digital talent, their expectation is that they want to upskill themselves. They want to actually learn. They want to have that continuous uh, learning with regards to the, uh, with regards to learning. That means with regards to understanding to, to gain uh, knowledge or certain uh, skill. Right, so uh, that is one thing about them. They 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 really much interested in learning. Uh, when we talk about digital talent as well, most of these uh, digital professional, 
they actually would prefer to work remotely rather than going to the office nine to five. Right? Mm -hmm. They would like to more uh, working more independent, having that uh, autonomous, uh, you know, uh, freedom, so that they become more, uh, so that they are able to be more creative. Right. So these are other things. They want flexible working hours. You know, they, they want to be given more independent of how they can do things, right? And at the same time, you, you know, they desire to work uh, that is much more meaningful. So, you know, if there is a purpose with regards to the activities or the, the operation in the organization, and it has purpose, that means it, it, it's about the environment or it's about the community, it's about this thing, you know, they, they become much more. Uh, involved, right? Uh, these are, the, uh, are the, 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 the things that they, they want to do, right? Uh, you know, for them, you know, uh, like having some sort of a work-life balance. Uh, in terms of the career growth and inclusiveness, they are very much in a very inclusive uh, environment where they actually uh, want to be able to to work, you know, with uh, 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 not to say a variety, but with a group of people that represent uh, not just their own group, but you know, with other group of people. But then, uh, the the things that I understand, if there is the intergenerational gap, you know, there's there's another issue that we have to look. But you know, they want to be more of uh, diversity and uh, inclusiveness, all right? Uh, so these are the expectation of the digital uh, talent, but it's the opposite of the organizational expectation. What they want is that they want people who are able to adapt, who uh, can change with the technology, right? So expect that digital talent to possess all the high-level technical expertise uh, in the area of data analytics, AI, cybersecurity, cloud computing, software development. So this is the skill that is not just desirable to them, but also they, they are very essential to the, the company in order for them to manage their uh, digital business. All right? And at the same time, they are looking for someone who have uh, who is of innovative, having that innovative uh, problem solver. Uh, they are able to actually uh, have that uh, talent that are able to understand not just the technology, but have the ability to think uh, strategically, understand how to use the, the digital tools to actually solve business problem. Uh, and they are having this thing, the teamwork, right, in terms of collaboration across the department. And the thing that is different from the digital talent is that they 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 put a target. That means it's all about the ROI of the company. Lastly, it comes back to the uh, return of the investment for their digital initiative. So this put a, a pressure to the uh, digital uh, talent. All right. So it creates a misalignment between these two groups, right? The digital talent and the organization. So the misalignment, the key misalignment would be the career. Um, career mismatch, right? So to the digital talent, they feel that they cannot move up, right? There's a, uh, you know, there's the, the, their mobility is being stagnant. You know, their role uh, is also very uh, stagnant. Uh, and this creates uh, frustration and disengagement between the digital talent and the organization, right? Because the digital talent uh, will seek somewhere else. So there will be a lot of uh, the, the turnover, it result in a high turnover. It also create a very rigid uh, work policy as well. And because of that, there is a resistance uh, between the uh, digital talent as well in terms of, uh, you know, because they opt to, to work uh, remote uh, work uh, option 
uh, they want flexible hours and you know the the, the young uh, talents you know the the young digital talent talent what they are focusing more is that uh, a culture that actually support their work life balance so they are more into that focus and it also the misalignment the key misalignment is the uh, cultural uh, misfit that means the focus uh, the 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 what we can say the 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 focus driven work you know is more of a purpose driven to rather than just uh, work to to have a uh, result right so more of the the the, the cultural misfit will be you know to to the organization they find that uh, the young group have like you no know, no this is their value this is the things you know it, it's not just about work it's, it's me about doing all these uh, things as well, right? Other things as well. So it, it become a misfit to the organization because this group are uh, saying that we have this value, we want to collaborate, we want to be innovative, but uh, there's a certain commitment to other things as well that they are focusing on, right? And lastly is the different speed of change to the digital uh, talent, you know, with their knowledge of the, the talents that uh, the digital uh, or the skill that they have, they, they are able to, to keep face with the advance of the technology. But in the organization, probably what happened is that, you know, uh, even though they want to transform themselves to the technology, with the technology, but there are certain resistance uh, towards changing, you know, the, the way that they do things. So now, but now most of the uh, organization, I think, are, are moving towards it. But these are uh, the things that is uh, happening, you know, for the digital professional. They are accustomed to, adapt, to adapting the new technology very quickly and following the trend. But to the organization, it's very slow in embarrass, uh, to embrace the, uh, what you call it, the, the transformation. So probably because of that as well, you know, there, there's a gap because, you know, they, they cannot uh, move on. There's lack of training being given to them and all those uh, things that is uh, happening due to the uh, gap, right? And the misalignment between the two, the two uh, group, all right? And in terms of uh, short-term focus for a company, they are pushing for immediate uh, result, right? Uh, so this have also put a, a pressure on the digital talent. So we need to uh, address this misalignment in terms of the career growth, in terms of the rigid work uh, policy, in terms of the cultural misfit, the difference uh, speed of uh, change, and also the uh, short term uh, process. So by recognizing this thing, probably, you know, uh, you know, I think we need to, to do a, a research on this issue to see whether these are the things that actually uh, broaden the gaps between the organization and also the, uh, uh, the, the talent, right? So if we are able to recognize this uh, gap, then organization are able to create more engaged, motivated, and productive uh, workforce that drive innovation and be successful in today's digital uh, market, right? Or digital age, right? So uh, I think I would uh, focus more on the, the things that is uh, happening to uh, in Malaysia. So we turn our attention to the Malaysian scenario regarding the digital skill gap. So it is crucial to highlight some of the key issues that have impact the workforce and also the business across the country. So one of the most uh, pressing issues in Malaysia is the demand for advance, is the growing demand for advanced digital skill. So we, if you look into my first introduction, right, first of the few slides, you know, there is a, a gap between the digital talent. That means we are lacking in terms of the digital uh, digital skill, right? Uh, so, you know, like 72% of the financial service firm, 
you know financial uh, institution are really the 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 ones that actually moving towards uh, the uh, digital right so now we are uh, you know but they are lacking in terms of finding they have difficulty in terms of finding employee who possess the advanced digital skill in uh, areas such as digital science data science artificial intelligence cyber security and the blockchain uh, development uh, this statistic is to be considered because this statistic is 2002 and I try to look for the, the latest, you know, uh, it doesn't, maybe uh, a study have not been done yet. So maybe there is already reduced, but I for, for now it's like very uh, alarming uh, to the uh, Malaysian uh, economy due to the, the you know, the, the, the shortage of the digital uh, talent, right? So as business increase to adopt this digital talent, the lack of scale poses a substantial uh, barrier to the growth, right? So there's also a workforce mismatch where 54% of the workforce in the country have least basic, have only have a least, at least basic digital, digital literacy, but fewer have a uh, specialized skill in the field, right? So these are, are the two key issues that is facing uh, in terms of the digital uh, skill gap. Uh, you know, or there's not, there are people very difficult to find uh, talent in the area of data science, AI, cybersecurity, and blockchain. And also the mismatch in terms of the workforce where, most of them have the uh, di basic digital literacy, but in terms of uh, specialization, uh, you know, uh, it's lacking in terms of that specialization, right? So in uh, uh, Malaysia do acknowledge, right, the, uh, about all these issue things, and they do provide some uh, roadmap in term uh, of bridging this uh, digital uh, skill, right? Uh, the gap. So one thing is that they try to develop a culture uh, that is uh, for for continuous uh, learning to this uh, digital talent, right? Or to this digital professional, where whereby they encourage. Uh, people to actually encourage the, 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 the talent to actually uh, continue with their learning, right? So, for example, uh, MEDEC, uh, MDEC have actually collaborated with the platform like Coursera, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Ude, uh, Udemy, Udemy, right? Uh, to actually uh, provide courses, right? That are much more uh, targeted, for example, for data science, AI computing, uh, cloud computing. They also uh, try to do, uh, to have a collaboration, a strategic partnership with the educational institution to actually uh, reduce the, the gap. For example, Taylor's University partnership with industry to provide micro uh, credential in the field such as blockchain. So, you know, what we have, the, the, the talent that we have now, you know, they can uh, improve uh, in certain uh, skill that is uh, lacking. So they have, uh, they can get it by using these uh, short courses to get that micro uh, credential, right? So it's also about uh, rescaling and upscaling the existing workforce. So uh, most of the uh, the initiative, for example, Maybank, they have, you know, provide this, what we call it, the future ready program to equip their Maybank employees, especially their digital talent with the necessary digital and technological skill, right? Uh, to be, to thrive their digital first banking environment. Uh, partnership collaboration where government initiate uh, initiative to help SME to adopt digital uh, technology by training the workers right with essential 
uh, digital technology and this initiative is what we call the uh, SME Goal Digital Initiative, right? So again, you know, uh, Malaysian Digital uh, Economic Blueprint, My Digital, to the support the professional development in high demand digital areas such as AI and uh, cyber security. So we need to foster uh, the uh, to upscale and uh, rescale, mostly of upscaling of the digital talent. Yeah. And then educating the uh, student in 5Gs and emerging uh, technology, uh, Ericsson collaborate with UNI, University Technology Malaysia, uh, UTM, right? And also Digital National Berhad to provide a micro credential program uh, that complement with the university degree you know, in order to reduce that uh, digital gap, right? Skill gap. So as we dive into the realm of uh, talent management, now, you know, what we have to do is, you know, we, we know what is the, 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 the expectation of the em employer, the organization, the expectation of the digital talent themselves, right? Now we need to look into how we manage the digital talent, right? So one of the significant advancements is that we can leverage on the artificial intelligence and uh, data analytics, where we use this uh, uh, technology to revolutionize how organization actually assess the skill, recruit the talent, and provide a uh, personalized employee uh, development, right? So by harnessing this uh, AI and digital talent, we can create a more efficient, effective, and responsive talent management process, right? So one of the, the notable example is uh, Unilever, uh, Unilever uh, AI-driven recruitment. So they use certain algorithm uh, to shift through, to look, to scan through all the application and assess the candidate uh, through gamified uh, assessment and also allow them to actually uh, evaluate the candidate skills and also their competency, right? So with this, they are able to look into a wide range of candidates with very, very various uh, background and uh, experience, right? So one thing also with regards to the digital talent is the to create a more dynamic and innovative workforce. Uh, it is essential uh, to focus on fostering the inclusion and uh, diversity within the uh, digital talent pool. So, you know, we need to, to be able, or the organization need to be able to create a, and targeted for the unpresented, uh, underpresented group to be in the group as well. So there will be like a sort of uh, knowledge uh, sharing in the organization. Because uh, as the new generation are coming in, you know, this is all about uh, knowledge sharing, information sharing, doing things together, you know, then this will actually uh, become much more, uh, a, you know, uh, you can create a, a better uh, digital uh, talent, right? So these uh, are some of the, uh, what we can we say, you know, a, a guide on how to move forward in terms of managing the uh, digital uh, talent. Okay. Uh, so, what are the key takes away from this uh, presentation? Right. So, what's uh, the main thing that we need uh, to do is that. The bridging the digital talent gap will drive the business strategy. If we are able to bridge the digital skill gap in our organization, then we are able to actually strategize. You know, we are able to, to make a better strategy 
come up with a better uh, strategy on how we can proceed by using the technology, right? Uh, by uh, adopting with the technology and working with uh, people who are uh, creative and uh, innovative. So the thing is that what we need to have align the talents need with flexible and inclusive policy, probably this is just a, a, a suggestion, right? I think those who are in the uh, the practitioner, they would have, uh, they would know more, right? So, and then invest in learning uh, and uh, also uh, diversify in order for the company or the organization to be uh, competitive and to sustain right in their uh, in the uh, business environment right so we need to be able to to explore right so as we move uh, towards the future it's vital for organization to align their talents need with flexible and inclusive uh, policies and also uh, create a work environment that value diversity and foster a culture of this uh, continuous uh, learning. Right. Uh, last uh, but not uh, least is the uh, uh, what are the message that we can get from this? The future depends on how we bridge the digital skill gap. So the future of the uh, you know the, the the talent, the future of the organization, right? It depends on how we actually manage our talent and we how well we bridge this gap. So by having that understanding as well. So uh, call for, uh, to action. That means um, we need to probably uh, collaborate with uh, educational institution, community organization, right? To create a target problem that support uh, in terms of uh, upscaling, rescaling our uh, digital uh, talent, right? So, organization need to assess their current talent development strategy and identify area of uh, improvement, right? With that, I end my presentation. So, thank you very much for the attention and hope that, you know, you get some uh, ideas of uh, what is it and how we as organization committee can move towards of bridging this uh, digital skill gap. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Professor Noor Akma. Couldn't agree more with that. Yes. <laughs> bridging the digital skills gap. Yeah, actually, digital skill gap exists even around us in our institution. Yeah. <laughs> Tradition itself is yes. happening. Mm -hmm. So it's all about the mismatch um, between the skills that company requires um, with what the employees actually possess. Yes. Yeah. And also she shows the data from Malaysia and Indonesian companies whereby um, they have shortage of employees with the advanced digital skills and it becomes the barrier for them to actually move and have digital transformation. Correct. Yes, and especially when there is new generation. All right, and there's a new generation <laughs> as well as the older generations mm -hmm. over there, and there is a very big gap in yeah. between them. Different traits from them. Right. And also, um, why actually this digital skill gap exists? And one of the reasons is because misalignment priorities of skills development and also the career uh, opportunities, culture and technical adoption. Yeah, so it's really interesting over here that this is actually the second time I'm hearing the words competitive advantage. Mm. So it is so important that we actually have this kind of uh, skills mm -hmm. that uh, the, the digital skills that it is uh, for a company to actually have that kind of competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. We we can't we can't do without this kind of digital skills. There is yet there is such a gap, mm -hmm. such a very big gap between the what the company expects and uh, uh, what the employees actually possess in terms of their skills. And uh, all the statistics actually point out to more than fifty percent of the companies actually are not uh, do not actually have enough of this kind of manpower to actually uh, 
drive their digital development. And uh, that is uh, the, the importance. That's the reason I think why uh, Prof. Noor actually mentioned as well about uh, having the institutions, uh, having a strategic partnership with all the companies. Yes. Yeah. So it is so important that because it is to provide this kind of skills development and uh, so that there is uh, the, 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 the talents actually has this kind of uh, skills to actually advance the company itself and they become more employable. So um, reskilling uh, to bridge this kind of uh, gap, uh, Prof. Noor actually did mention as well about reskilling and, and upskilling the existing workforce uh, to retrain and promote uh, the people actually internally. And uh, of course, uh, she did mention again about partnership to train the workers and uh, fostering employee development to integrate digital literacy into their learning. And uh, of course, educate all the students, uh, the students in 5G and any of the emerging technologies. And uh, again, uh, this is the second time I'm, I'm seeing this as well, is a leverage of the AI and data. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of people actually, a lot of uh, academics now say that uh, data is actually the new oil. Mm -hmm. Data is a new oil. Whoever possess data, possess power. Mm -hmm. So this is a this is one of the interesting things that um, she mentioned. Uh, Prof. Noor actually mentioned as well that uh, these uh, companies also start to use this kind of AI to actually assess the skills, even to actually recruit people yes. into, into the company and using the data analytics actually to track their progress. And uh, this, uh, the, the, the takeaway is also uh, a very good takeaway for all of us to actually bridge the digital gap to drive the business strategy. And this is actually to drive the competitive advantage of the different companies and uh, align the talent needs with their uh, flexible, inclusive uh, policies is um, more towards of how you uh, bring them together um, and actually to assimilate them into the uh, sometimes misfit of the culture in the company in terms of their uh, digital talents. And of course, investing in the learning as well. So this is a very interesting and very informative for all of us. And it, it actually... Uh, gives us a very, it's, it's, it's a push for all of us as mm -hmm. well, right? Mm -hmm. To actually learn. Yes. To actually learn yes. so to have the digital mm -hmm. literacy and as well for the institutions. Yes, for yeah. institution too. Yeah. Okay, so thank you, uh, Professor Noor Akma. And we would like to move to our third speaker. Yes, let's move to our third speaker. So our third speaker has uh, completed his undergraduate education in business administration with a concentration in human resource management. He received the Dean's Award and the University Book Prize Award at graduation for his academic achievement. During his undergraduate education, he was also elected as the general chairperson of the Indonesian Student Association from 2011 to 2012. The president of the business club, uh, the Faculty of Economics and Management, UKM, 2011 to 2012, and was involved and participated in the Knowing Asian Plus 3 program in 2010 in Beijing, China. Knowing Asian Plus 3 in 2011 in South Korea. He obtained his master's and doctoral education from the National University of Malaysia with an interest in human resource management and quality and productivity improvement. He also received training and certifications in his field, such as internal editors of ISO 9001-2015 training, development of productivity protect practitioners for the youth in Mongolia, INDEF School of Political Economy, TOT, Strengthening of National Values by Lemhanas RE, CPHRM Certified Professional in Human Resource Management, and IRCP, Industrial Relations Certification Program. Certification from the Indonesian Employees Association and the Faculty of Law, University of Indonesia. In addition, he also joined several organizations related to his field, among them the Academy of Management, the Human Resource Management Association, and the Indonesian Quality Productivity Management Association. Wow, that's very incredible. So let us welcome Associate Professor Arif Murti Rosamuri. Very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all MC. <laughs> it's good to see you, sir. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm in nice place. to meet you also. Yeah, we can hear you and we can see your slide as well. Yes, the slides. We can see the slides clearly. Yep. Okay, can we start? Yes, sure. you may start okay. now. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon to all of participants uh, committee in the new management uh, institute business technology Plata Indonesia. My name is Arif Porti from University of Pertamina. For today, I will sharing to all of you about the SR perspective on digital talent for business. In the first of all, I would like I would like to say thank you to our top management and then the chair of the Ecobima, Tan uh, Ecobima, Dr. Ayu, and then Dr. Nicholas and all our committee for the invitation. Today we are looking about the industrial revolution, not only one, but now until four, one, two, three, four. We are looking uh, changing from the manual. And then we're changing the machine, and then now we're changing on uh, technology. Uh, technology. If we are looking technology, we are not only talking about the only technology, but we are already uh, looking about the cloud computing, and then we move to artificial intelligence, and then big data, and also Internet of Things. And then uh, for business, how about for business? So the big question is how about affect the industrialization uh, for business. Of course, we are looking about so many movement during the process, during the transformation uh, of the business. We are looking at the changing not only on marketing, not only on finance, not only on operation, and then not only on media or anything else, but we are looking at the movement and changing from the human resource. And now some of uh, company, they are not calling human resource, but human capital. Human as a capital, not a resource. And then the, the question is why uh, we must focus on HR? Why we must looking on HR or human capital? What What is important HR? This one is the big question, uh, maybe in the digital talent. In HR, we are not only focused on recruitment and selection. But we are looking about the performance. We are looking about the good person and then talented person. The first point is uh, depend on HR because HR will be uh, what is the standard, what is the requirement for the employee. So the important thing is why HR important on this as, uh, aspect. And then. We are looking about the process in business actually in HR. When we are looking on HR, we are not only talking about the human resource planning and then recruitment selection and then terminate, not on that. But we are looking the bigger uh, function of, of HR. Actually, HR uh, starting from the human resource planning, how about the recruitment, how about the forecast for uh, employee and then how about the downsizing company? company? Of course, uh, HR must be recruitment. HR must think about the selection process. This this one is the first part, uh, how to search the talented worker. So HR must identify and select competent uh, employee. The next is after they get a good, good employee joined to the organization, how to maintain, how to provide the employee uh, with the up-to-date skills and knowledge. So from what? Of course, from the orientation and training. And then after that, uh, HR must provide uh, not only orientation and training, after they are working, HR must give like performance management, how they assess the performance. And then after the company, the employee perform, how about the compensation and benefit? And after that, uh, how about the career development? This part is uh, really important how to maintain, especially for talented worker, and then how to attract, how to get the talented worker. Of course, the talented worker, they want about the good compensation and then good career development and also good uh, assessment and transparent assessment. 
That's why uh, the company uh, must be developed and then settle on that thing. So how to, uh, to attract the talented worker? Uh, of course, uh, this process actually not easy, especially for the small company. In bigger company is maybe okay because in HR department they are not only one person or two person, maybe more. In 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 each section they are, they have person, especially they have a department recruitment and then they have the department selection and then uh, separate department uh, focus on orientation and training and then they have about the. Uh, department performance and then concession benefit and also career development. That's one is uh, why the HR uh, is important, especially uh, in our topic about the digital talent. Because the first uh, division will be get the talented worker is HR. Now we are moving HR not only as uh, administrative and then HR not only recruitment selection, but HR now moving. Uh, as a HRBP, HR as a business partner, HR is must be uh, related with the vision mission of the company. That's one is uh, why the HR is important, especially on digital talent for business. And then how about uh, now? And then we are looking about the business already changed. We are not only on manual. We are we are already moving from machine to the technology, and then we are already moving from the Technology also we are using uh, artificial intelligence and then we are uh, using the cloud computing and or anything else. That's why is uh, they are changing the competitive business. Yeah, we, they are changing about the process and then they are changing about the technology. Now we are looking about the technology impact for business. How about the technology impact for business? Of course, it was so many impact for business, uh, Doctor. Prof. Akmal already mentioned about upskill and reskill, and then we are looking in the slide uh, the data fifty uh, percent actually uh, organizations stay reskilling uh, their workforce is important yeah uh, around the for the another one one years or twelve or until nineteen months, and then we are looking about the technology is uh, give so many impact for business uh, some company they must uh, don't sizing their 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 staff and then they must uh, change about the regulation and then they must change the, the process and system because impact of technology and then now we, we are looking about the how about the uh, work career trends especially in in business and in uh, business and also in hr we are looking step issue Actually, uh, company uh, increasingly hiring for specific skills. That's why a big problem. And then from the International Labor Organization, to, to 2022 already mentioned uh, uh, cause of unemployment. First is technology. Second is globalization. Third is economics. And fourth is shift in consumer preference. This data actually from uh, International Labor Organization. Why uh, some employees they are not an employed? Because yeah, first is technological change. That's why they need the new skills and then new competency. And then some employees they are problem on that. That's why they are not uh, get another offer. And then how about the focus area for critical to change? We already know about the problem and employment. First is technological globalization, and then uh, economics, and also shift in consumer preference. So, how about the critical area to change? Uh, now we are divided uh, into four. First is strategy. Second, second is social impact, and then third is talent, and then fourth is uh, technology. But we are focused and uh, on talent. So how to develop a uh, talented person, how to develop talent workers, how to maintain talent workers, how to attract talent workers. That's why uh, the company must give attention, especially a uh, commitment for the training and development. Of course, a talented person, we must give opportunity to uh, study, we must give opportunity to training and also development. That's why it's a uh, four key area critical to change. And then how about the 
HR future trends. Uh, we are already looking uh, in on our slide uh, from the Forbes 2021. Uh, HR future trend is first is upskilling and reskilling. Of course, we are moving from manual, machine, and the technology. Uh, we must upgrade our employees. Not only same skill, must a different skills. Must maybe maybe new machine. Not only the same machine and the new technology. Not not only on the uh, old old technology. And for the first is upskilling and reskilling. Second is new era of leadership. We are looking as a future trend is a new era of leadership. Now in pandemic, we are already working on uh, WFR work from home, work from office. And now we are already familiar with new term is work from anywhere. So we can work actually from anywhere. And also leadership style must be changed uh, for the future. And then third is top talent management. This one is how to attract, how to develop, and then how to give reward for career and opportunity for the talent management. And then uh, for the last is employee well-being. Employee well-being for the last. And then next is how about the high demand skills and then uh, skills uh, for the 2027 based on the report of Pro Economic Forum. And now we are looking high demand skills and hard skill first. For the soft skill already mentioned also in the World Economic Forum report, uh, the skill is uh, emotional, critical, logical, analytical thinking, flexibility, and adaptability. How about the hard skill for talent for digital? Uh, we are looking about the social media and digital marketing, programming, data science, or, or anything else. And then the build slide actually related with top 10 skills uh, World Economic Forum. Yeah, we can check from the report of uh, World Economic Forum. I already mentioned about the top 10 skills. First is uh, analytical thinking and then creative thinking, resilience, uh, motivation, and then self-awareness, curiosity, lifelong learning, technological literacy, and then uh, and the last is quality control. And then how about the uh, HR future uh, challenge, especially for the uh, digital talent for uh, workers so first is we are looking about the challenge uh new hybrid way of working actually now we are already implement in our conference we are hybrid conference not only online but juga, but we have participant uh, offline second is increasingly complex stakeholder expectation and then third is not a new dynamic talent landscape and then uh, next is new adaptation to technology and automation and then last is a uh, faster pace of business. And then next is uh, we are looking about the uh, how about in Indonesia. We are already uh, looking about digital talents uh, in Malaysia. And then we are looking uh, about the what is uh, the competency they need for the uh, future. And then how about the company and business, especially in Indonesia, already digital. We are looking. First is Gojek and then Genius, Tokopedia, Telkom. All of this company already moving from manual, from the uh, manual to the uh, technology. And then they are already moving from the digi, uh, from the manual to digital also. And then we are looking about the another company in Indonesia already moving. Uh, Traveloka, Ruangbulu, Ruangbulu, Halodog, and also Ajaib Securitas already moving. They are not now. Everyone can access not, not only in office. You can access uh, from anywhere. You can find if you want to buy a ticket or you want to consult the doctor or you want to uh, buy something. You can easy to find and easy to communicate. And also their company they give the opportunity for their workers uh, to choose whatever they want to work uh, from home and also. Uh, they want to work from the uh, office. And then next, uh, how about the challenges in digital talent in Indonesia? Actually, we have a big, a bigger number for the productive age. Actually, we have uh, 69 uh, from the total population. Yeah. The bigger number. 
then how about their uh, average using the mobile mobile phone actually uh, from the data uh, they are using mobile phone around six hours in in, in the day so yeah. the big uh, big big duration yeah using the mobile phone so for what they are using phone actually uh, they are using mobile phone to send maybe participant and we also uh, for photo video sharing or communication using whatsapp and anything else email or anything we are may maybe read uh, newspaper and then information and then entertainment and then online shopping no we are looking uh, the generation and then the, the behavior from the uh, customer and then from the workers actually movement from the uh, the face to face and then now we are maybe is comfortable using online why because uh, they 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 will use more uh, mobile phone yeah rather than others and then how about digitalization in human resource and then we are looking the digitalization in human resource actually uh, now every company already using about the ATS for applicant tracking system for recruitment process and then using chat box and then performance management uh, for example if you have uh, one position uh, in uh, your company maybe you can get the more applic more applicant not only 10 if you the position only one maybe the applicant uh, 100 or uh, more so that's if the checking process still manual quite difficult that's why some company already using the applicant tracking system for CV selection based on uh, decide uh, criteria and then we are looking about the virtual or online interview already digital especially in HR we are not uh, offline interview or uh, offline recruitment but now some company already using uh, online platform for the recruitment and then for the first step of uh, their test and then how about the application or tools in human resource uh, actually we can uh, looking about the some application already help to hr uh, to <clears throat> perform and then to to focus on their job uh, such as is Zoho Recruit, Latest, Fresh Team, Monday.com, and Personio. This one is example of application HR can use, especially for uh, to get the talented uh, employees. I think that's all our presentation. Uh, so the perspective is on digital talent is quite uh, difficult, especially in HR. We are not only how to attract but uh, we are must focus how to develop uh, our employee to become as a talented person, but not only on talented uh, in their field, but how to talented on digital also. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good afternoon. All right. Thank you so much. Much, Mr. Arif Murthy. Thank you so much. <laughs> that's very innovative. That's very informative. Yes, and actually, Mr. Arif Murthy is talking from the is looking from the company's point of view, like especially the HR. Yeah, HR you know? side of things. Yes, and he mentioned about how to attract the talented workers, um, because it is not easy, especially for the smaller companies compared to the bigger companies, since they only have like few people to work on that. Right. Yes, and he also mentioned about. Um, attracting and maintaining these talented workers through training and development, which is not that easy. And we can see like in our society and the companies in Indonesia, it's really hard to make the people to really adapt into the new technologies. Yeah, to, yeah. To, to allow to, to make them change. Yeah, to make That's them a... change because not everyone loves changes. Correct. <laughs> Changes is hard. Yeah, changes is hard. Yeah, so we see uh, Prof. Arif also mentioned about the future trend as well, mm -hmm. that uh, this is uh, so important that is to uh, have the new area of a leadership. Right? So it's a way you have a clear and a transparent work arrangement, especially when it comes to flexible work arrangement as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Prof. Arif also mentioned about some of the challenges, which one of them is actually uh, there is a very dynamic talent landscape in the future, especially with this kind of uh, fast moving technologies. I think uh, this, uh, the, how, how dynamic this is going to just get, the, the changes is just going to get faster. Yes. And definitely one of the <clears throat> challenge with the digital talent is that because they are they become so dependent on uh, digital digitalizations for everything that uh, it could actually lead to uh, future digital addictions. So will it be a threat? <laughs> well, in the future, I'm not sure. I mean, it's uh, it is it is a question that's yet to be answered. I think, mm -hmm. yeah. So, but it is uh, it is possible that it could become a digital addiction, which we already begin to see nowadays. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's a uh, very informative, uh, Prof Arif, uh, and it's very insightful as well. Uh, thank you so much for your uh presentations. So we will move on to the next next speaker. speaker. Last but not least, our fourth speaker. So, our fourth speaker is a highly experienced software developer and technical lead with over 20 years experience in software development. Um, specializing in enterprise resource planning or ERP, machine learning, high performance computing, video surveillance, and oil and gas solutions. And he's proven expertise as software engineer and technical lead and developing innovative solutions across diverse industries, including finance, geophysics, and education. And also proven success in both industry and academia with skills in translating research into practical applications and delivering complex technical concepts effectively. Um, he pursued his Bachelor of Economics in Management in Universitas Riau back in 2001. And he continued his Master of Information Technology in Machine Learning in University Kebangsaan Malaysia. And then he's currently pursuing a PhD in Computer Science at University Kebangsaan Malaysia, specializing in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Wow. All right. And... He was also a programmer at Chevron Pacific Indonesia back in 2001 till 2005 and continued as staff researcher at Mimos Berhad, um, Malaysia, and then as senior software developer at Leap Energy Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and then as software architect for um, Petronas Malaysia back in 2015 to 2022. And he is currently a technical lead at Unit 4 APAC Asia Pacific. Um, some of the awards and patents. So ITEX bronze medal in 2008 from Jawi Intelligence Character Recognition. And he also have um, multiple patents in web-based video surveillance and media content delivery. All right, so let's welcome our fourth speaker, Mr. Ramon Redika from Unit 4 APAC. Uh, Assalamualaikum hey. and thank good you. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you everyone. Good afternoon. So, and welcome to this uh, international conference for all of us and also participants and students. Can you hear me right? So I can try to share the screen first. Yes, yes sure. we can hear you. We can hear you clearly. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for Institute Pelita Indonesia for inviting me in this uh, dynamic digital talents for strategic business. Let me introduce myself. My name is Raymond Redika, and I will be the one of your speaker along with others. And together, we are really excited to discuss and talk about the technology that really incredible in this really incredible conference. Okay, um, next slide. Today, we're going to talk about very excited technology and the foundation is very fast phase moving field. And the field that has been rapidly changing over the past eight years and changing the world, of course, which is known as deep learning. All of us know that. And then now over the past decade, in fact, uh, even before I start this presenting uh, this topic in this conference, AI and deep learning has really been revolutionizing is, uh, so many different advances and so many different areas of science, 
like mathematics, physics, finance, medical, and so on. And not that long ago, uh, we were having a challenge and problems that we didn't think were necessarily solvable in our lifetimes. That AI now is actually solving it beyond human performance today. So uh, now in the educa educational institutions, for example, specifically for uh, computer science, like in university, each year that we teach this course, the, le the lecture in particular getting harder and harder to teach because this course uh, were rapidly changing and AI and deep learning lecture supposed to be cover the foundation and also the progress from today. We compare with other course one-to-one -one with mathematics, biology, those lecture, it doesn't really change that much over time, but we are in rapidly changing field of AI and deep learning where it's rapidly changing. So let me give uh, you an example how we introduced this, uh, this deep learning only a few, uh, few years ago. Yeah. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicaid. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups and you can get charged more just for being a woman. To give his employees oh, together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small uh, kinds of legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama. When you're giving a speech, make sure you use a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We're developing technology. Okay, so yeah, you I'm can thinking... heard that voice, right? So um, actually, you know that actually it's a deep fact. Deep fact is uh, the people can create the contents over the internet. It's not originally, it's a fact. This is a really surprising thing about that video to me when we saw it uh, was how viral it went a few years ago, over the million view within only a couple of months, that video very viral. And people were shocked uh, with a few things, but the main one is uh, was a realism that AI to be able to generate the content that looks, sounds and extremely hyper-realistic. Maybe a lot of you not really even impressed by the technology today because you see all of a mass thing and AI and deep learning are producing. Now, uh, fast forward today, the progress uh, in deep learning, uh, people were making of kind of, uh, you know, an exciting remark about it when it comes to a few years ago. Now, this is a common stuff because AI is uh, really doing much thing for full uh, uh, compared to this uh, fun little introductory video, right? So today, um, compared to eight years ago, now where we are, AI now is uh, generating the content with deep learning being so commoditized uh, only in your fingertips, now online and smartphone and so on. Okay, so in fact, uh, we can use deep learning to generate this type of hyper-realistic pieces of media and content entirely from English language, right? Uh, without even coding anymore. So today uh, we have a free tools for us, all of us. We will do that for us end to end uh, directly from our finger using English language or any language, I think. The brand's knowledge is uh, of resources is called natural language processing. All guys, all, all of you guys, I think is, I believe that you know that about ChatGPT, right? And just recently, I just, uh, I just did a conversation with the funds, uh, natural language processing tools. I'm asking the question. Give me example of incredible photo uh, can generate by AI to represent deep learning. So he gave me this idea with a couple of sentence explanations and a concept he called it AI natural network uh, become reality. This is so amazing, right? So uh, for your information, this incredible image is 
which designed from scratch based on the concept using a Dell E model is their model. It wasn't taken from the uh, from a copy from any sources of image, or created uh, by. It's actually created by the AI generation process based on my request, based on the description and concept that he given to me. Yeah, and then my favorite uh, is actually how to ask this deep learning model to create a new type of software because I am software developer. Even uh, themselves is software, right? So I've I've tried the simple questions to to him. I've asked deep learning to provide me the some functions to calculate range month with a given two period, which is a period to period from. So because uh, some you, of some of you guys are working in accounting, maybe I understand this about the period from and period through, period two, right? So here is the example in the real work, which is I have a task, a simple task to give a robust solution. When I say it's robust solution, it's actually to cover all the scenario, which is to calculate thing for me, the uh, range of month in the same year, in a different year, and tell me in the programming language. So neural network are uh, giving me and write me C sharp programming language. Uh, it's provide me the details, explanations, line of the code. And, and even further, I also asked to write another language. Yeah, another language. Yeah, it's like conversation with the robot. Can you write an SQL language? And then, it's again, it's provide me with a correctly and also a complete explanation. It's so amazing, right? So actually, this is just highlighting how far deep learning has gone even a couple of years since I've started studying about machine learning in 2006 uh, until 2009. I mean, going back even before that uh, few many years ago, and the most amazing thing that you see, I try to do here is to present you the foundation of all of this. How is this different types of model uh, can help us on research and daily work? Yeah. So, um, but uh, like I mentioned in the beginning uh, to intro introduction, the presenting deep learning is getting harder and harder to do. And I don't know where uh, this field is going to be next year. I mean, uh, my honest truth is even honestly, even one or month, one or two months next from now, uh, it's a moving to the incredible fast maybe. But what I do know is that uh, we will share with you the concept of foundation, little bit of a story for all the technology uh, of the technology of that we have seen up until this point, and we will allow. It will help you to uh, to create your future and yourself to helping your career and your research using those fundamental and those foundation to let getting started with it. Okay. So what is deep learning? Uh, the term that deep learning to me is a very exciting branch of machine learning. This is deep learning. It's a part of machine learning that use data, a lot of data to teach computer to do things that previously only humans capable before. Yeah. And then if you're asking me uh, my interest, uh, I'm very interested to solve the perceptions problem. Actually it's uh, machine, lear machine learning and deep learning is actually try to solve the perception problem. Like for example, we try to recognizing what inside is, is inside the image the people talking on the phone and uh, helping robot to explore the world and interact with it, like ChatGPT is actually the fundamental of it. And deep learning has emerged uh, central tools to solve uh, perceptions problem in recent years. It is a state of art of everything uh, having to do with the computer vision, speak recognition, natural language processing, and there is more. Increasingly, uh, people finding that deep learning is much better tools to solve a problem like discovering new medicines, uh, understanding natural language, understanding document, for example, ranking them for search, and etc. So, uh, many companies today have met deep learning uh, as a central part of their machine learning uh, toolkit. Like Facebook, we can say that it's a big, big company, Baidu, Microsoft, Google, Amazon. They're all using deep learning in their product and pushing the research forward. Even the oil company currently is, uh, they do a business transformation when I work in Petronas. 
uh, they already transformed the geophysics into research of machine learning. And then it's easy to understand why, because deep learning is fine whenever there is a lot of data and complex problem to solve. And all of these companies are facing a lot of complicated problems like understanding uh, and also analyt analytic what is inside the image for the oil and gas. They, they try to understand what is inside the seismic, how to uh, find the oil and etc. Yeah. And then uh, if we compare with uh, what is the changes between uh, 20 years ago compared to deep learning. So what a nice, what, uh, the nice thing about deep learning now is a really familiar technique and that adapt all the short of data and short of problem all using a common infrastructure now and using a common language to describe things. Last time when I did the uh, uh, working in machine learning, I was doing a research and handwritten recognition and video analytic and video surveillance. Whenever we met the people doing the same thing, we have a very low income to talk about because we use a different acronym, we use a different technique and collaboration is pretty much impossible. Deep learning is really changed that. Deep learning applicable to almost everything that can be applied in many fields, engineer, researcher, data scientist, uh, oil and gas, share the common powerful setup tools because the tools is free like a TensorFlow, uh, PyTorch, which is actually very encouraged the research to become a uh, standard, uh, world standard currently. Yeah. So if you look at the machine learning previously, if they want to uh, classify the input of car, they do a feature instructions. Uh, it we call that uh, handcrafted features. We try to segmentize the uh, uh, the car, where is a wheel, where is a uh, door. So when we already segmentize that become part by parts, and then some of the researcher extract that into the big metric and do a classification into the, the machine learning, but now it's different. We know we no need to do a feature extraction because machine learning will do that for you. You just give an image to them and then they will extract for you and classify for you. So this is called that a feature map. So it means that during the, the learning of the image itself, during the learning of the data and pattern, they will extract the feature map for us. And then this is the, uh, actually the, uh, the architecture it looks like here. Yeah. Yeah. This is a change, a very, very big change here. Okay, when, when, we, when we say about the, when we want to talk about the history of this machine learning a few, uh, few years ago, uh, in, in the 80, right? In the 80, it's actually there is a, a research similar to this one is by Fukushima, is similar architecture to this deep learning. But, uh, but because the, the computer at that time is very slow is, and then the data is also very tiny and very small, and that's why it's, uh, it's not really success to, uh, to become a powerful machine learning at the time. So around 2009, uh, uh, actually the neural network is actually very disappears on the research world. So the people changed to the uh, probabilistic and statistical method like uh, hidden Markov model and et cetera. And neural network is like completely disappeared from the real world of machine learning. And working in machine uh, neural network is was a uh, different fringe. Only a few years ago, uh, when in, in 2009, uh, when the, they are successful on the speech recognition uh, and then in 2012 in computer vision, the neural network is uh, made a big comeback. What changes is uh, because of we have a lot of data now and we have a very fast computer and GPU is actually previously is for the gamer is to do a gaming, right? Because uh, inside this uh, GPU, there is a very fast calculation for tensor. Tensor is a 3D or maybe more than 3D like a metric. Metric is 2D, but tensor is more than that. So. Uh, when we talk about uh, deep learning, uh, the building block of uh, deep learning is actually a classification. I mean, so like when you understand the classification, you can do the regressions and then you can do a uh, ranking and prediction. And you can also do a uh, prediction, stock market prediction, re uh, credit risk assessment, or 
algorithmic threading, and you also do I can do a de detection for, for example, live CCTV camera. Yeah. So uh, the building block is actually uh, the algorithm is similar, and then this is the center of it. Yeah. Um, I'm going to show you the example of neural network classification. Uh, this is a how is a, to, to create a training set there. For example, we have a, we have to uh, identify how is actually to, uh, to classify this one. So we have a training data, like simple is like this. So we have zero, one, and after that we label it, and then we do a training, and then after that we comes with the testing data. We we have a model already, and we can classify that. So if you can uh, going deeply a little bit, so this is actually the uh, the data looks like so because the image is a part of the uh, pixel and pixel pixel data, right? For example, we have uh, we have a big uh, a picture like this one, and then maybe the pixel is seven hundred eighty four. So we put all together into the matrix multiplication, and after that we do a training using neural network. And then uh, we try to ranking them from class to class, for example, from zero to 10. And then after that, the deep learning will giving or neural network will give the answer to this one. This is the answer, this high probability of the uh, features. On in here. Okay, now we understand that it's a piece of function, uh, input and and the reason that the in, that the input last time is we call this feature instruction features. And after that, there is a function and there is an output. So it's simple as that, right? So uh, how is uh, to understand neural network? So we will need to start from the very fundamental mathematics a little bit. It's not, not that detailed, but uh, it's actually uh, simple, a uh, little, bit, little bit simple. So there is a number, number in and number out. This is a function, right? So in this case, your input is x and your output is y. You can plot into the function that, uh, for example, you you have to you, you have a data that regression linear like x plus b. Of course, it's actually very straight like this one and a polynomial like this one. So uh, if you know the functions, that is nothing to do with uh, to predicting the function in that. But if you have a problem with the data that we, you don't know the functions, so we need a data for it. That's why if you have a data and you, if you have an answer and label it, uh, you can get the answer uh, by the machine learning, uh, by doing the uh, extracting the features and doing a proper back propagation. After that, they, they will create a model. So this is how to, uh, to understand the pattern and also to, uh, to generate for you the model itself. So no worries about that because uh, because in uh, currently in the internet there are a lot of tools that is actually explain to you how is uh, deep learning is uh, working actually. So this is the input data. This is a hidden layer. This is your distribution data, and then uh, we can see here is a uh, they they show the uh, the pattern of the data. And then after that. This is they will they will show the neuron weightage and when they do a training they can immediately uh, giving you uh, an accurate distinguish between blue and orange point right and building a decision boundaries and separate them. So this is approximate thing actually. The function that describe the data is learning and capable of learning uh, different data set and we can throw in it. So. What is in the middle section here is, the middle section is actually the hidden layer. Hidden layer is a neuron which take all the input from your previous layer. And then uh, the, the current layer will produce uh, another another output and then it will give the input to the, that layer. So this is layer by layer. Last time in the, during uh, 20 years ago, maybe computer slow, very slow to do this one. They only able to do one layer to uh, to train this one. And nowadays, even uh, the model of machine learning, they have hundred layer. Its capability of the computer currently is very fast, so there's no problem of uh, training a big data currently. Okay, this is uh, another video that to show 
this and then activation function. This is a relu, maybe. The, yeah, I think it's, this is already similar for the previous example. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, it's actually uh, similar to regression linear. When when you do a regression linear, you have a W is X plus B, right? So this is A and this is B. X plus B is equal to Y, this is one. And then, but you have a, a many, many data samples. That's why you say a, a weightage, they call it weightage, weightage plus I, X1, weightage plus sample data two and et cetera, and multiple by bias. They will do a, a approximation from this one. But, but of course, uh, if you look at to this uh, example, here is actually, we try to predict the, uh, the curve, but of course we cannot do that because the linear function is only can solve the linear, which is a straight line. So that's why uh, uh, the research is uh, going forward after that, they, they found that ReLU, ReLU is actually to, uh, to solving the uh, nonlinearity to maximize the, uh, which is, uh, is, above, is above zero, uh, there will be a value, but if uh, below zero, they will um, become zero. So this this one will become uh, a functions to uh, to make that uh, to make this this activation functions can predict the pattern of it. Yeah, you can see the video here. Is we cannot do that. Right? Then after that, after we solve by uh, nonlinearity, they can uh, easily predict this pattern. Maybe this is still working on it. Yeah, this is ReLU. So this is the graph is look like. <clears throat> yeah, this is a call neuron activations. And uh, this is a graph look like, means that if you have a distribution data is above zero, then they will give you some value. But if a below zero means that negative, they will not giving you a value. So this is uh, actually the technique to, to make the activation functions uh, can predict this pattern. Yeah, so we repeat again, uh, the similar setup of the regression linear giving the distribution data. And then this is the actual machine learning can detect the polynomial functions here. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But by doing the back propagation of actually, they will compare the input uh, with the output until the loss is very small. And then they will comes with the uh, model, which is actually very suitable to use a very high accuracy to that. Yeah, yeah. even if we look to the uh, more sophisticated problems uh, for the uh, spiral, it's not, it's not a simple data like this. They, they also can solve that with the many, many layer. You can play around with the, Playground TensorFlow RG here. Yeah, they can demo it here later on to, to show you spiral. This one. This one is quite difficult to uh to classify, right? But they they're able to do that currently by adding a new and more more layers to that. Adding more layers and they will do a back propagations to that. And then they can easily classify this uh, pattern of, of uh, by, by distinguish between data and data. So this is called a universal function approximator, actually. Yeah. Okay. So um, means that we can easily say that we can classify everything, right? So sorry, classify everything. The doc, if uh, the doc picture we can give to machine learning, they will give an answer doc. Natural language processing also doing the same thing. Uh, if we are want to translating the language uh, from one language to another language, we give to the model, then they can translate it. And then everything is uh, similar to the video, to the image, to the text and to the voice. It can be classified now using neural network. Is it true neural network can learn anything? So this is actually something that we need to figure out a little bit. Actually, real world problem, you need a deep model using deep learning. So this is not easy actually, because you have to fine tune uh, 
the hyperparameter until the model is uh, the model is suitable to uh, to answer the real world problems. And then after that, as you know, we need a data because when you have a small data, of course they do approximation like a pro uh, linear regression linear, and maybe they mistakenly giving a, a answer like this. That's why you have to need a lot of data to 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 training the the deep learning to become a real uh, to, to solve the uh, uh, real world real world problems. This is a video of back propagations. Uh, sorry. They try to. Uh, this is a real uh, a real record of the machine learning how they predict the pattern from our distribution data, and then they can try to fitting that into the suite, uh, into the uh, into the model, which is they they try to fit uh, using the uh, back propagations. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. So we call this one as universal function approximator. Yeah. So back to the story again. So, uh, actually, uh, machine learning of neural network is not something new in fan by human previously in uh, during uh, 18 and 1974 until 1972. Uh, Fukushima already in fan this one, but at the time, like I told you before, the computer is very slow and the data is very tiny. And then um, during the 89, uh, Yan Lei Chun is actually his vice president of Facebook. Previously, they very intense to uh, to research about the neural network, convolution neural network. So today is actually proven that neural, uh, convolution neural network is actually the, uh, the stable feature extraction. This is a very common in the, in the research, right? When, when all the researchers all over the world try to uh, compete how to extract, uh, how, how is effectively to, uh, to classify some image. So uh, and nowadays we, uh, we, we get the answer already. Actually, we no need to extract the features by mathematical function that we create our own. For example, we try to segmentize, we try to find the, the shape, we try, for example, I, I want to, uh, classify my face. I want to separate between eye and nose and everything. It's similar to uh, to image in here. Uh, we try to classify how many dots they have. And uh, the last time is they doing like that. But now it's actually all it's automatic. So the, uh, the people try to get rid from uh, manual enforcement by the human. So the machine will do that everything for us. Okay, this is a feature map that I am. Uh, I thought just now, which is previously when you when you see here uh, the journey of the research last time when the people try to uh, recognize the face uh, of human, they try to uh, segmentize eye and nose. They try to find the position of it. So they uh, and then after that they can train these uh, features uh, using a uh, no, metric multiplications. Yeah, because his image is represented by zero to two five five is color image, right? And then after that, uh, they do a back propagation also actually, but it's not effective enough. So now, this is a feature map. Machine learning actually using a convolutions uh, kernel, uh, the images can be extract immediately. We can see here is a pattern is very very uh, obvious to human eyes, right? It's actually edge detection of here. This is called a feature map. So uh, convolution is actually um, is a simple function. Previously, is a uh, using by uh, by another image processing to convolute uh, convolute that, uh, the image. For example, we try to detect edge detection. We try to make the image sharpen. So actually, the uh, the window is symmetric uh, three by three. You you can play around with this. This is a core kernel. It's actually in a in a convolution, and and then. Last time, uh, this convolution is uh, being used for for uh, for image processing. They try to sharpen, they try to blur blur the image, they try to do a Gaussian, they try to detect the uh, edge detection. But nowadays, they they found that using this uh, window, actually can do a multiplication with the original image behind this one with the 
kernel itself and then do a machine learning do a back propagation and then after that they they will get the uh, feature map uh, from this convolution filter so mm -hmm. and then another another important finding is a uh, redu uh, the one that just now i explained about that previously the people is uh, using activation function is uh, like sigmoid now is uh, they found is redu redu is very effective for uh, to nonlinearity uh, approximations and then um, outside there, we we can see that there is a tools to see how is actually the machine learning uh, choose their features. Uh, got some scientists and also some website can explain that from the pixel, and then uh, they will immediately show in the real time uh, where is actually the pixel going through. And then this is a just analysis of the uh, how is machine learning working. Last time is uh, we thought that machine learning is a black box. Now it's actually they can explain how is actually the machine learning is working actually, yeah. Okay, um, as we know, machine learning is can be solvable by the commercial company is a uh, start from 2012 actually, when last time is just uh, uh, we as academic is just uh, inside the paper is something like promising, but can also sell in the industry, right? So starting from 2012, machine learning is a, uh, something that is proven it can be used in the in, in the real world mm -hmm. so why why is this uh, can be uh can i mean why we can be achieve that we we already told that is a uh, because of computer is very fast which is a uh, 50 times speed up over the cpu currently gpu and then uh to to training the very deep hidden layer you can see this hidden layer last time it's only one layer it's actually the computer is need one week to training that, but now is uh, they can do uh, uh, even hundred layers to to training that, and then uh, and then also the other uh, encouraged resources become uh, become this one is become supported is because a big big company is uh, given a, a given some money to to researchers and with a big investment like. Uh, you know, uh, open AI, right? Microsoft itself is in phase one billion to that. And uh, they now actually it's chat GPT is open source, but it's actually a uh, fund by Microsoft actually. So the, then because of that, uh, the, the, also supported by the community, since that the big company like Google, Microsoft and Amazon and Baidu giving a uh, free tools to the researchers like uh, TensorFlow, PyTorch, even now it's not programmer doing a, Coding, you know, engineering, like uh, engineer or also uh, financial. I, I believe that financial, financial researcher also they can uh, uh, code with Python actually. So uh, you don't need to uh, you need to care about the how is mathematics uh, working at the behind because uh, they will provide you everything with a free library as long as you understand the concept of it and you can do your research. Yeah. Of course, in financial business, is very, very, is very important to to use this tool currently. Yeah. So that's only my uh, my presentation for today. Is is just to hope that Pita uh, Indonesia also uh, as a university or institute they have to do that differently. But I believe they already uh, did that because it's from the presentation earlier that I can see that all, all of the presenter is already pursue to the machine learning and then look like it's, uh, it's already very adopt to that. Yeah. So machine learning is sort of, uh, is some of something like, it's a new world now. It's a new technology that you have to adapt with that. You cannot uh, stay uh, with the old technology and with the old, uh, with the old program in university. It has an ambition to change the world, you know, at least uh, for example, for in financial world, in the HR, in the computer science, and and, ev and every domain now is actually adopting machine learning. There is a competitive advantage currently in industry. You know, many people are not early adopter. Maybe some uh, some people is already early adopt adopt that. So probably going uh, have to hatch over multiple years uh, that. Uh, so means that here is relative to basis uh, there is uh, some value and second thing is too that is a difficulty we have uh, between uh, quant uh, quantitative and qualitative so actually 
when we think uh, machine learning is sufficiently flexible to do uh, reconcile of uh, the two aspect and combination of that two game changer. So I think it's uh, another domain like financial or HR can do this, uh, can do this as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's all my presentation currently. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Raymond Radika. Yes. Wow. Um, next time, I think we should invite, re-invite Mr. Raymond because this is very interesting, especially for our um, students from the computer, from science. The computer science school. <laughs> yes. This is very interesting, actually. Okay. Um, so I'm actually quite amazed how the AI deep learning can do. And it's also scary how people can use AI to manipulate things and then creating fake news, um, especially in Indonesia, where the media literacy is still quite concerning. Concerning. <laughs> yes, yeah. still quite concerning. That's why our government uh, continuously give uh, media literacy education to prepare the people to be more mature um, and then can counter the fake and be created news yes for example yeah and information and also maybe do a self-censorship <laughs> especially during this kind of political year correct yeah. yeah and on the other hand the ai or the deep learning can actually do a lot of things like coding um created by the ai and also prediction of the stock market and data classification actually there's a lot of stuff that we can a lot of benefits that we can obtain if we use the technology properly yes mm -hmm. and uh, this is uh, the thing about the uh, extraction of the data uh, mr raymond also mentioned about uh, when you want to get uh, useful uh, information mm -hmm. result out of mm -hmm. it data is important mm -hmm. uh, you need to have a a lot of data without a lot of data the model will not actually work out as uh, as well so um and because of the development of the uh, computers and the computing and advancement there it actually helps to actually advance this uh, ai advance ai into a, a new a new level right now um as to a point of like a language translator, it is able to translate languages mm -hmm. as well as that, uh, as, as you mentioned about the uh, classifications. And uh, with that, uh, however, uh, Mr. Raymond also mentioned that neural network also cannot learn everything. Mm -hmm. It needs data. Small data, it may just give you a very linear answer, but the large data is able to train the model. So. Um, there is a need for us to actually begin to move towards into this AI to actually help us uh, to enhance our understanding of the things around us as well. Yeah, this is a very informative. And as you mentioned, it's, uh, it's good to, to actually invite Mr. Raymond next time to our computing school yeah, to actually absolutely. speak there. <laughs> this is very informative. Yes. All right. So we have done with all the presentations and we are entering our next session. Yes. Let's enter into our next session. So for the next session, uh, we will be entering our Q&A session. And we will first open for two, two questions. Sure. Right? Two, two questions. questions. So if you have any questions, so please click the raise hand button. Yes. If you have any questions, you may click the raise hand button yep. in the Zoom instead of just Raising, raising your, your hands, hands manually. Yeah. And as a gentle reminder, um, we have the attendance link, which will be shared soon. So later, you need to upload your screenshot of your face in this webinar. So it's a, just a proof that you attend the ICOBIMA today. Okay, so any questions from the audience before I read the questions from the Zoom chat? I think I saw... Some, Some questions. Questions from the Zoom chat, yeah. Okay, there is a question here from Christy Veronica from Pelita, Indonesia. Um, may I see? Okay, so the question is for Mr. Arif. 
The question is how to improve our business talent on this digital era with minimum infrastructure. This is for Mr. Arif. So Mr. Arif, do you want to answer right away? Okay. Thank you very much. Really interesting question from the Christy Veronica from IBTPI. The question is how to improve our business development with minimum infrastructure. So actually, uh, now uh, we are looking at uh, was so many uh, training, actually, training and development in online. So we can use first is like uh, online uh, develop uh, training or development so we can join uh, if you have a minimum infrastructure and the second is you can uh, use like the virtual collaboration now you can actually collaborate not only people from indonesia you can collaborate people from malaysia or anything else but you can join as a community now in gen z area or in millennial actually they have so many uh, platform uh, in digital uh, Maybe I can uh, give an uh, example like the export. The export. You can see the, the platform, uh, especially in digital, uh, not only from the ministry. They have the training on the how to export uh, your product, but uh, you have you can find from the Instagram also, from the website also, the community, especially community, they give uh, a platform software and then you can join on that. And then, uh, thus, of course, from that you can uh, get a networking online and then you can uh, improve, uh, especially on your digital talent uh, or for yourself. I think that's all my answer moderator or MC. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Arif. Um, Christy, is it clear? Um, okay. Hi, Christy. Is it clear enough for the answer? Christy, uh, you may try to unmute. Unmute the microphone. Okay, Christy, is it clear for the answer from Mr. Arif? I guess it's clear already. It's clear. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is there any other questions from the audience? Okay, there is actually another question from the Zoom chat. Why are you guys? Yeah. <laughs> why, 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 why not just yes, do it live? <laughs> okay. Okay, so. This is from uh, Mr. Praba. Mr. or Mrs. Praba from Udayana University. Mm -hmm. Our uh, This is for Dr. Siti. Uh, as I am a Balinese, which all may know, Bali is popular by its tourism. I was amazed by the project from Dr. City. My question is, could you please elaborate how the project could give the advantages specifically for the tourism companies in Bali? All right, Dr. So City? It's for Dr. City. Is Dr. City still? Okay, still yes. here with us. I'm here. Hello again. Um, thank you so much, um, Prabha. Um, I love Bali, have been to Bali um, once, but always dreamed about going again. So Bali is definitely one of the top tourist attractions and destination, especially even among the Europeans and people in the UK. If they talk about going to Indonesia, it would definitely be Bali. But I always encourage sustainable tourism. So I also think, you know, Pekanbaru might have something that we can work on to develop for tourism. Um, there's a trend towards rural tourism, so I think it could work. Now, back to your question, how can my project actually benefit um, tourism companies? 
Um, if I quote one of the examples of the project, which is the gamified app by Seppo.io, that idea came about because mm. we wanted to promote inclusivity. On a um, semester basis, our international tourism students actually get to go to a destination and study about the tourist attractions there. So um, it's free. We provide the transportation. All students need to do is to sign up for it. They pay nothing um, and they get to enjoy the destination for one day. But the problem is that um, some of the students have different challenges not being able to attend because of their taking care of family members, because we do have students who, have, uh, who are working, um, who have different physical challenges not being able to go on the bus and so on. So we think about how we can make it more inclusive. So this goes back to actually the concept of inclusive tourism. Um, I feel that with technology, we can actually help to create inclusive tourism. So people who have certain disadvantage, um, who are too old, who are not mobile, who are not able to visit to these places, can still enjoy and experience this if they have technology. Combine, I can feel that if we combine the app with some sort of a VR, people can still actually be able to visit the place, get to know the destination, um, and really immerse themselves maybe in the, you know, the traditional Balinese dance and so on. So I think this is one of one of the ways that you know can be used for promoting Bali for people who are not able to go. Um, so this is actually a very not a very new form of tourism, but this is something which is really, really lacking in a lot of tourism companies because they only consider tourists that are able to visit. But what about tourists who do not have the ability? How can they still enjoy? How can they still be a tourist? Yeah, I hope I've uh, provided a little bit of um, answer to Prabha there. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Siti. Um, Prabha, Prabha. Okay. Okay, is it clear? Is it clear from Dr. Siti? Yes. Oh, okay, so Dr. Siti, if I um, can uh, conclude the answer, so it's the benefit to the uh, tourism companies in Bali, it's like an uh, indirect uh, benefit. So it is from the promotion. So it's not like a, it's not like a direct uh, beneficial to the, to the companies itself, if I'm not mistaken. Please. I think if you want to compare for businesses between making money, profit, um, yeah. versus the non-tangible aspects such as, you know, branding, image, social responsibility. Um, marketing has always had a very negative connotation. People always think that negative is perceived as a negative tool to gain money, gain profit for businesses. Um, I feel that now we need to explore on how we can leverage on marketing for a positive purpose. So it's not just measuring based on how much you know, tourists are paying for their um, um, holiday packages and how it would benefit profitably to a tourist company. But also think about what the tourist companies can do for the society through marketing. Is that okay? Is that clear enough? I think uh, it's... Uh, all right, thank you so much for the first again. I think uh, everything is clear for me. Yes, yes, all clear. All right. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Raba, and thank you too, Dr. Siti. And we have more questions There's actually more questions here. here. Mm, okay. So this is the third question from... Is it from is their name? Oh, Fix Stanley. Yes, this yeah. is a uh, Pelita Indonesia student. So the question is for Dr. City 2. 
what uh, does future content marketing still rely on influencer marketing or is it already taking advantage of the role of AI? So this is the question. <laughs> Very good question, Vic. Um, I, I love this kind of questions because it really gets you thinking, isn't it? Uh, between the current role of influencers and also the role of AI. So I think you probably captured my presentation where I had three different pictures um, and maybe you were able to identify which image was actually created by an AI. Now, interestingly, um, what we found out was I always give students example of Billy Wonka and also DPD. These are the two companies that actually used AI in promoting. So Willy Wonka is a chocolate company. Uh, I'm sure sometimes you have heard of Willy Wonka, you know, the movie before. And how did they use um, AI? They actually use AI to create a promotional ad campaign for them. It was for an event, right? And they sent it out. It was published. It was publicized, put on, you know, different platforms. And sadly, they did not do any checking or proofreading. So that advertisement went out with a bunch of spelling errors, a lot of spelling mistakes. And on the day of the actual event, it was completely different than what they portrayed on the advertisement. So you can imagine the advertisement on the ad, there were a lot of chocolates, there were a lot of balloons, there were a lot of fun, colorful things and decorations. But on the day when the children went for that event, all they got was one small chocolate no decorations, nothing. So I think, yes, AI is infiltrating into marketing. We can see that a lot of marketing agencies are using copyright AI, copyright.ai. It is um, a website that allows you to uh, get uh, copyrights or taglines or slogans for your advertisements and whatever news that you want. However, um, there still need to be some due diligence from the company side. You still need to check. You still need to, need to make, make sure that, you know, what you are putting out there for the mass is actually um, correct and true, right? So I would say uh, in terms of versus influencer marketing, influencer marketing will always still be there um, using whether micro-influencers or celebrity influencers, they still carry some sort of weightage just because a lot of the followers have this kind of parasocial attachment towards the influencers. So there is a parasocial theory that talks about how attached the viewers are to the influencers. So with a tool like AI that is intangible, which you can't see, that parasocial attachment may be lacking. So for instance, um, you know, you, I'm sure you follow a lot of influencers, right, Vic, and all the other students. Um, and you take it a point that every day you need to see a posting in your TikTok from that particular influencer. And if the influencer doesn't post anything for one whole week, you will feel like, what is wrong with this influencer? Why is it not active? Why am I not seeing on my news feed? Where is the POV of the day that I'm waiting for? Where is the get ready with me for today from the influencer? So you will feel something missing, isn't it? That is because of that parasocial attachment that you have. Okay. So influencer marketing, I feel, will still be around for many years to come. In terms of how much the influence is, we are still yet to know. So that's why uh, one of my projects is actually looking into that, whether will the role of AI or AI-generated image overtake influencer marketing, or perhaps influencer marketing using AI these days. So instead of um, creating their own images, creating their own videos, they might be using AI in their videos, and what would be the impact? So very interesting future to look forward to, isn't it, Vic? Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, this is a very, it's going to be an interesting future mm -hmm. for when you come to AI. Okay, so Vic, how is it? Is it clear enough? Uh, it's, it's clear, uh, but uh, I don't know how to like 
to make uh like uh people must like in this year have like uh make like content creator so how to like of the social media or the thing will how to, how to create content yes and like uh the popular just like that okay vic wants to become a content creator i'll tell you some things that i know from my analytics do short videos start with short videos of less than five seconds because based on the analytics on tiktok people will scroll away in three seconds so you've got only three seconds to capture the attention of people if you don't have an interesting cover you don't have an interesting start then you're going to lose your whoever that is viewing yeah another thing is catch on the trends if you want to create content look at what is trending now you know what is trending now oh you have to be demure you have to be uh, sophisticated uh, that is the you trend see. you see yeah i can see it mindful yes. <laughs> Uh, so those are the things that you have to quickly catch on. You cannot wait and say, oh, I'll do the video tomorrow because by tomorrow, it's a different trend altogether. Or what I would encourage is try to start your own trend. Have your own niche. So you notice that a lot of the influencers these days, content creators, what they do is they pin on one particular niche, whether it is cooking, if they're very good in cooking or they're not good in cooking, they try to highlight that. Um, or if let's say they're very good in makeup, they just do a lot of makeup videos. So I think identifying your own offerings to the viewers and don't give up because the thing with TikTok is perseverance. The thing with content is perseverance. If you notice a lot of the influencers that suddenly got a few hundred thousand uh, likes, it's not that they just started yesterday. They did like so many videos for maybe the past three years. Yeah. So if you scroll back, you will notice, oh, they have been doing this a long time. And they started also from very little views as well. All right. So I'm not very proud. I've been doing TikTok for like two years now. I've only got 211 followers. Um, my highest video view was actually 10.7K. Um, and that's not even done by me. It's done by my student. So I believe that, you know, students have that creativity. Okay, wow. <laughs> that's actually great tips. Yeah, those are great tips. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Siti. And also, big thank you for the question. Um, okay, we have more questions. Yeah? We have more questions. This time, it's for Professor Nur Akma. Okay, so from Jos Wandi from Pelita Indonesia students, um, the question is, what is the weakness of digital skill gap and how to solve it? Um, actually, how to solve the digital skill gap? Yeah, digital yeah. skill gap, yes. <laughs> solve that problem. Yes. This is for Professor Noor Akma. Okay. Professor Noor? Uh, you know, as I mentioned in the uh, what you call it, the presentation just now, the the main thing is actually resistant to change. So, mm -hmm. and you know, because of due to the limited access as well. So, some uh, employee and organization are very resistant to adopt. You know, I think like the moderator just now was telling as well, you know, you, you know, the, the acceptance in terms of receptive towards the technology, towards the, the culture, you know, uh, it's just resistant to change. So that is the, the main issue why there is a digital skill gap as well, because, you know, there's some intergenerational gap as well. And at the same time, the main witnesses, uh, the employee, some of the employee and some of the organization are very much resistant to changes. So why? Probably because there's a fear of uh, displacement, job displacement, right? And then for, for the, the company, because they have been in the business, especially the last organization, they has been in business for a, a long time. So maybe, you know, in terms of their organizational culture, 
also hinders them to, to have that changes. So that is the, the main point. And another thing, probably uh, the, the problem is with regards to the uh, education. You know, when we talk about uh, the digital education and training, so, you know, it doesn't, uh, what's the expectation or what is out in the uh, practice and what has been taught in the uh, school uh, or the university curriculum, uh, there's a, you know, it's go into parallel. It doesn't merge or meet to certain part of, uh, you know, uh, things that the, the practitioner and the uh, education is or looking at so it's, it's very much different so probably that is the the two weaknesses why that exists with this uh, digital cat okay. i hope that answered the question all right thank you Prof. thank Noor. you Prof. Noor. Um, josh how's it is it Does clear answer question Can answer does it answer your question uh, it's clear thank you miss in okay. terms of solution, is, uh, you need to change. So there's a change management in the organization. You know, uh, the solution is that. And with regards to the education, that means both the educators and the uh, practitioner, they have to meet so that we are able to, to come up with a, a syllabus that actually able to cater to the practice. Okay, hey. thank you, uh, Prof. Noor and Joss. Thank you for the question. So we have to accept changes. Yeah, <laughs> we have there to is accept. no growth in comfort zone. Yes, yeah, no the growth thing. in comfort zone. That's true. All right. Um, I think we have one more question. One more question here. It's Who from Kim, from Paulina Francisca. Paulina Francisca for Mr. Mr. Raymond. Raymond. Okay, Paulina Francisca uh, from Pelita, Indonesia. The question is, how can organizations maximize AI retaining talent in their companies? So this is for Mr. Mr. Raymond. Raymond. Okay, uh, thank you. This is a very good question. So, um, I can answer it just based on the experience and based on the environment that I can see the uh, company that I joined that previously and also currently. So uh, many company now is uh, aligned with the AI talent. Uh, it's uh, similar to their strategic visions, which is uh, very clearly communicate that they, they want to transform into uh, professional AI, which is the AI engineer have, have a contributions to, they have a, a very long-term goal in their work so, and and beside that, uh, many companies is invest to the cutting edge project. For example, they uh, even in every month they have a crazy lab days because and crazy lab days is uh, normally is a uh, getting the talent of the uh, how they uh, they get the talent from the uh, from their employee who is actually uh, having a having a good experience in AI. So they can join the very special teams. And and an employee itself is understand that how important and and they also involved in in a meaningful projects uh, such as applying uh, AI in global and challenge and exploring novel resources in there. So and after that, I can see also uh, the the culture is of also and beside the culture is also fun fun of the research project. For example, in the oil company, they they already transforms. Uh, uh, the engineering, like previously, is just doing the mathematical uh, solutions in the geophysics, for example, and geology. Now, all of them is uh, they learn from the beginning again to to do AI because the management itself is to to show to the employee that this is a new a new domain of work that uh, employee have to uh, adapt with that one. They they cannot. Um, they cannot just uh, maintain with the old uh, old way how they solve the problems for uh, for the data. So that's why it's a, uh, there is a competitive here. Even even the company itself is actually looking to the uh, expertise here is and and retain the talent is a is a very uh, um, 
it's a max the the talent is a very uh, very important role in 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 the company yeah i think is a uh, is it enough to get the, uh, the answer okay thank you mr raymond paulina is it answering your question is it clear enough Okay, Paulina, you may try to unmute the microphone. Is it clear? Yes, okay. Thank you, Mr. Raymond. Yeah, no problem. All right. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Raymond and Paulina for the question. Um, so <laughs> I think we are actually run out of time. Yeah, yeah. Out of time here. And um, we have shared the attendance link in the Zoom chat, so you may click the link and fill out the name and the email and uh, other stuff. And then don't forget to upload the screenshot in the attendance link too, so that there is a proof that you are attending this ICOBIMA. Okay. Um, so we are ending the Q&A session and we are inviting everyone to activate the camera because the operator will do some documentation. So. We will count one, two, three, and then please smile and wave your hands to the camera in one, two, and three. Smile. Okay, still smiley. <laughs> okay, are we done? Are we done? All right. Perfect. We are done. So we have come to the end of the first session of this international conference. We will be continuing tomorrow morning at 8.30 a.m. for the parallel session. The participants who have submitted their paper and will do the presentation will be divided into 15 breakout rooms. Please take note that each participant will be only given seven minutes for the presentations. You can join the breakout room tomorrow according to the list provided by the committee in the WhatsApp group. Yes, also, we would like to thank all the keynote speakers, Dr. Siti Intan Nurdiana Wong, Abdullah, Professor Dr. Nur Akma Muhammad Saleh, and then Associate Professor Arif Murti, um, and Mr. Raman Redika for the time and insights. We hope that everything shared and discussed will be useful for everyone. Thank you for joining us today, and see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.